today we are very pleased to do with the IMF an event on IMF and capital controls and policy implications. As the world economy recovers from the Great Recession, short-term capital flows are once again increasing in developing countries. In the past, short-term and speculative capital flows have made it more difficult for governments to manage their most important macroeconomic policies, including monetary and exchange rates. Rapid outflows have contributed greatly to economic and financial crises in many countries. In February this year, as I'm sure you all noted, the economists of the IMF published a paper which concluded that under certain circumstances, the use of capital controls is justified as part of the policy toolkit to manage inflows. I think many of us at the time were wondering, uh, now that the IMF has acknowledged uh, that sometimes capital controls can be useful, what are the policy implications following on from the paper? So today, we're very pleased to have two distinguished economists to discuss this matter and look forward to having a lively discussion afterwards. We will have Mr. Reza Bakir, uh, who is the Deputy Chief for Emerging Markets in the IMS Strategy, Policy, and Review Department, as well as Mark Weisbrot, who is the Co-Director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CBER. So we're first going to hear from Mr. Bakir on the IMS perspective, and then from Mr. Weisbrot. Mr. Bakir, as I said, is the Deputy Chief for Emerging Markets in the IMS Strategy, Policy, and Review Department, which has responsibility for consistency in IMF policy advice across countries, including on capital controls issues. Mr. Bakir has been with the IMF since 2000, and prior to this assignment, he was the IMF's resident representative to the Philippines, and he's also held country positions in China, Thailand, and Brazil. His research has been published in several journals of the economics profession, including the Journal of Political Economy and the Quarterly Journal of Economics. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. So without further ado, I'll get over to you. Thank, Thank you, you, Deborah and Mark, for the uh, invitation today to talk on uh, an issue that is, as you would agree, very timely. I think uh, every few days you read in the press and in fact, now even in media outlets like the NPR on dealing with capital inflows. And it's um, just one indication of how much of an issue this has become for some emerging markets as they come out of the crisis. It's also a reminder to me of how time flies, because I think it was not perhaps just a year ago when some of these very countries were bemoaning the flight out of capital in the depth of the financial crisis that we were in. So it reminds me also of how quickly things change, and this is one of the aspects of this issue, which is that you get sudden <coughs> and sharp surges and turnarounds in capital flows. I uh, uh, want to tell you uh, a little bit about what I do at the IMF before I get into what I'm going to talk about. Uh, as Deborah mentioned, um, I work in a department of the IMF called Strategy, Policy, and Review. It's a mouthful. But in a nutshell, uh, this is a central department in the IMF, so it doesn't have any one specific regional focus, but works on cross-cutting issues in all the regions, and has responsibility for things like developing IMF policy, so an example would be when we came out recently with new lending facilities for emerging markets, namely the flexible credit line, and the broader reform of IMF lending framework, that work, for instance, was done in our department together with other departments. And that was an example of creating policy, changing policy, new lending instruments in response to members' needs. So one central area of our work is to think about how IMF needs to adapt and evolve in response to the evolving needs of members. Uh, within this department, I work on in a division focused on emerging markets. So what I will talk about today will be geared from that perspective. And I should also say at the beginning that I guess as a reflection of the time we're in, I'll be mostly talking about dealing with inflows and that you know we had a rich and lively debate a few years ago on dealing with outflows and capital controls on outflows, but I will be talking primarily on how to cope with inflows. So I want to cover basically three quick things, and I want to leave um, plenty of time uh, for discussion. First, motivationally, why 
you know, it is um, relevant and important to be talking of capital controls at this point. Um, second, what kind of a framework might countries use as one framework as they consider various options, policy options that they have in the face of capital inflows? And finally, you know, there is a, menu, a small menu of the types of measures that countries have tried and what are the pros and cons of different types of measures that countries use. I should say that a lot of this you might see is from a very practical uh, point of view uh, in terms of if countries have to do it, you know, when they should do it, and to what means they should uh, do it. Uh, should also introduce to my left, uh, Mahavesh Qureshi, who's also from the IMF, and she is one of the co-authors of the staff position note that came out that Deborah mentioned earlier. So if you have any questions that are specific to that paper, Mahavish would also be very happy to answer your questions. Um, and finally, by way of setting the scope of what I'm going to be talking about, when I refer to capital controls here, I am referring to price-based measures uh, primarily, examples of which would be, say, the tax that Brazil put recently on capital inflows, or the unremunerated reserve requirement that Chile used. So I'll be referring to these types of measures when I say capital controls, and then I will also be referring to use of prudential measures to cope with inflows. So, you know, internally we were struggling about what to call this, and sometimes we use the term unconventional measures simply because conventional measures include, you know, uh, monetary and fiscal policy and exchange rate policy and reserve policy. So uh, here I'm going to talk about capital controls and prudential measures um, in this thing. So by way of uh, motivation, I want to show you two quick charts. The one on the left in the red, uh, <laughs> sorry, let me start with the blue. The line in blue is one measure of uh, liquidity in advanced economies. Uh, it basically is, you know, is built upon monetary policy indicators of few of the largest economies in the world. It is overlaid with the line in red, which is a proxy measure for total flows to emerging markets. This is a proxy measure in the sense that for those of you who uh, are technically oriented, it is constructed from the trade balance and the change in reserves. The advantage is that it's available on a higher frequency. The disadvantage is that it's only a proxy because it does not correct for things like exchange rate movement and other factors. The point, though, is that these two lines are quite correlated. In particular, when you have accommodative and easy money policies in advanced economies, they have typically, historically, been associated with an increase of capital flows to emerging markets. So if you look at this chart right now, and if you see where we are, and this, um, uh, you might think that we are at the cusp of yet another surge of capital flows to emerging markets. A, the chart on the right uses the same proxy index, but gives a little bit of country flavor for the amount of flows. And some of the countries that you will see at the very top of this chart were the very same countries which have been in the press recently as either having introduced some kind of measures or at least struggling with coping with inflows. So the point of these two charts is that you know there is a lot of uh, there is a potential for a lot more inflows uh, to emerging markets going ahead. Uh, and it's therefore a good time to consider what sort of a framework might we think about for emerging markets on coping. Excuse me. You see the end date on this chart? Is it, is it, it this year? It is January? just 
shy of the end of this year, I have actually used this from a presentation I did a couple of months ago. If you update it, which we did recently, the trend is the same. I have a chart in the background section that I can come to as well, which plots this over the last 25 years. This is actually a modified version of a chart that was published in our World Economic Outlook in 2007, which focused on these issues of spillovers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, if you're interested, I can show you and I can give you the reference um, on that. So transitioning then to you know, facing this challenge, how, what might be you know, one framework to think about policy options that countries have. So the idea is to have uh, a consistent framework that nevertheless allows for different advice to different countries. And I'm going to try to walk you through you know, one way that one might think about country uh, options. So consider uh, you know, a number of countries facing inflows and you know, if you are the policymaker in that country, your task is to think what is the appropriate policy response. You could use several criteria. The first criteria could be based upon your exchange rate and an assessment of whether the exchange rate is not undervalued. So here, in this representation, the circle, or the set, represents cases where the exchange rate is not undervalued. I hope you can see this line connecting. So this circle, think of things inside this, case, this circle as representing cases where the exchange rate is not undervalued. So if you're outside this circle, then either the exchange rate is fairly valued or it's overvalued. Yeah. If this were the only consideration and the exchange rate you know, was not undervalued, then, you know, one of the responses you might consider is to let the exchange rate appreciate in response to inflows. So exchange rate is the first of three criteria that I'm going to lay out in this chart. The second that a policymaker might want to think about is a judgment on whether the country's reserves are adequate. In practice, you could do this with you know, different metrics, and there is a lot of work in this area. But uh, using these different measures, th this circle therefore represents cases where <coughs> you might consider that you know, reserves in your country are also adequate. Outside this circle means that policymakers feel there is a need for further reserve buildup. And therefore, if you're facing inflows, that might be a good opportunity, in part, to build reserves. You could sterilize it or not sterilize it, depending in part on um, one other factor, which would be the state of the economy itself, whether it is overheating in the cyclical position. So some countries right now, some emerging markets, not all, are coming out of the crisis quite rapidly and are further ahead in the cycle than others. And so this circle over here in blue represents, uh, I don't know how the colors come out over here, cases where the economy is considered to be overheating. So cases outside of this are where the economy is not overheating. So you can, uh, in that case, um, lower rates meaning uh, you can ease monetary policy. And you can think about also the altering the mix between monetary and fiscal policy. And this is what I abbreviate here by rebalance. So rebalance is code for changing the mix between monetary and fiscal policy. So what I tried to do in this is to put out three criteria and talk about how, if each of these was not applying, what kind of a policy response you might do. Now, you could have cases where the exchange rate is not undervalued, reserves are judged to be adequate, and the economy is overheating. And one of the options that policymakers face 
as an option in the policy toolkit would be to consider whether it's appropriate to use such price-based capital controls and prudential measures to cope with inflows. Now, the purpose of this slide then, uh, if I've successfully walked you through the, th the three criteria, was to lay out a framework as to how you might want to begin to think about the issue as to what might be appropriate policy responses. But this is half of the story. To complete the story, one needs to tailor whatever comes out to country-specific circumstances. And there are several considerations uh, that are important. First, from the country perspective. Um, and I've mentioned three factors here, but there could be more depending upon the particular country that one is in. You know, first is the views themselves of stakeholders, of people who are in the markets, policymakers, others, as well as the prior experience that the country may have had with the use of any such capital controls in the past. And, um, you know, I, um, when I was um, based in Manila as the IMF's res rep, one of the things I learned a lot about was, you know, there is no substitute for experience and country-specific knowledge that people had there from having dealt with capital flows issues over the past, you know, number of years. So it's extremely important because the perspective that, you know, that perspective, especially with history, can sometimes suggest that even if you think that, you know, using a control might be appropriate, they may have tried it in the past, may not have worked because of, you know, a combination of factors, and that's one important factor you need to think about. Another criteria is administrative capacity. If you have a country where you feel you control everything very well, or you have uh, mechanisms where what you want to do will be implemented, well, you know, then you have a bigger hope of realizing what you wanted to do. In other cases, if that is not the case, then you want to think of a type of measure which does not, for its efficacy, depend, you know, on administrative capacity, but maybe is a broad measure that, you know, is at the policy level that can address capital flows. And finally is the scope for evasion, and it's closely tied to considerations of administrative capacity, but it is also tied to how deep and liquid capital markets in the country might be, and how much presence you have of big financial players and sophisticated financial players who, as soon as one tries to introduce some kind of a control, can, of course, think of clever ways to circumvent such control. So the point I wanted to make here is that these are some of the considerations from a country perspective that are important in tailoring whatever one comes up with from a general framework that I presented before. But just as country considerations are important, it's also important to think of an issue from the multilateral perspective. And this is you know, an issue that pertains to the global financial architecture, so it's a hard issue for a country on its own to internalize. Now what I mean here is that if you think of all emerging markets, that they are all going to respond to capital inflows by not allowing exchange rates to appreciate. And at the same time, you have current account surpluses in emerging markets. How are you going to get rebalancing? So this is an issue where somehow one needs to have a mechanism where countries can internalize the consequences, the global public good nature, you know, the spillover nature of their consequences on other countries. And this is part of a very, you know, complex, actively debated issue. So I'm not going to say more about it here, but just to highlight that this is an issue, for instance, that we struggle with when we think about, you know, when the use of controls may be appropriate. So uh, I've given you. Uh, you know, I mean, I've shared with you some thoughts on how, if you know, if you were in a country where you think about these things, I want to give a slightly uh, different flavor to you now of what actually has been happening 
recently from what we could judge. So, you know, we gave uh, a, um, a presentation a little while ago on the same issue, and we thought for that it would be interesting to do a quick in-house survey of um, our economists as to, in response to the recent inflows of capital, what measures had countries taken to cope with such inflows. So I thought it might be interesting to just list them so that we can get a sense of what has actually been happening. And these are listed on the left. Uh, allow appreciation, accumulate reserves, allow relaxed limits on outflows. Incidentally, Philippines did that well before the crisis, um, after Philippines implemented some reforms which markedly turned around investor sentiment and they began to get a lot of money in. Right? So uh, they, in fact, listed, lifted controls on outflows uh, because it was a good time from their perspective to move in the direction of capital liberalization, which is one of the things that they had wanted to do. Historically, as you know, emerging markets have been more concerned about certain outflows of capitals and therefore you know, have had controls in place sometimes when, from the time when they may have experienced a crisis. Uh, but then these other measures in pink are all, you know, types of measures that you could think about that are going beyond, you know, sort of fiscal monetary and, you know, reserve type measures. So these include reinstating or, re or raising reserve requirements on, fo on foreign currency deposits, reinstating external borrowing limits uh, for banks and corporates, imposing a tax on inflows like Brazil, or strengthening macro potential rules. We also looked at um, what is some of the advice that is being provided um, uh, across cases. And as you can see, there is also a combination of advice provided, allowing exchange rate flexibility, building reserves, structural measures, which include some of the prudential measures we were talking about, fiscal monetary policy, and unconventional measures to cope with capital inflows. Now, what I want to do then is I want to end with just two slides, just as I've gotten a warning from Deborah um, that people are beginning to fall asleep. So unfortunately, these two slides are not going to wake you up because they're going to be even more boring, because they're going to talk about um, you know, what are criteria you might want to think about when practically you want to do some kind of a capital control. Uh, the first issue, though, I want to raise is one of effectiveness. And this is a key uh, decision variable. Uh, do you want a measure to be broad based or not? Now, the arguments for and against. If you have a measure that is not broad based, so you think that, for instance, one type of inflow is bad, that's a portfolio inflow, and you think another type of inflow is good, for example, you think FDI is good, and you devise a measure which is going to target portfolio inflows. But as soon as you do that, as soon as you target, you are going to create the incentive for somebody to try to circumvent it. So the trade-off here is that you can have a measure that's not targeted, and therefore more difficult to circumvent. Uh, or you can have a targeted measure, but that may not be very effective in terms of stemming the total volume of it. So, so you know, uh, this is an issue. Second criteria you might want to think about is how easy it would be to enforce, depending upon what I mentioned earlier, say the administ administrative capacity of institutions, history. And finally, a measure that's easy to adjust so that if it is a tax or if it is some other kind of an impediment for private parties doing business, what are going to be the costs to them of adjusting this measure. So you want to think about those considerations as well. Finally, then, let me end on a slide which just lays out some of the pros and cons of um, some measures which have been used by countries to cope with inflows. I start first with a tax on inflows. So this is something um, uh, uh, you know, which would typically be administered by the revenue authority. Uh, it has pros such, um, you know, uh, uh, you can broad, you, you can have a broad base, you can adjust the rate, and you know you can build up revenue buffers during inflows. That's good, that are going to go in your, you know, fiscal buffers, so that when you have a bust, 
you can use that money to ease the pain that is typically associated with a sharp outflow of capital. Cons might include, you know, the efficiency of the tax collection agency, um, and you know, transactions can move offshore. URR here refers to an unremunerated reserve requirement, as um, one example that is often cited about is Chile. Uh, in some, some of the pros are similar to that of a tax on inflows, um, but typically because you know an unremunerated reserve requirement requires you putting up a unremunerated deposit, if the funding cost in hard currencies is very low, you know, the cost of that measure or the pain that it inflicts upon you is low. So these days, you know, interest rates on hard currencies are very low, so that might be one consideration that you may want to take into account as well. And third, I list uh, prudential measures for cyclical purposes. You know, they have a con that immediately they'll affect banks. Uh, and they can be adjusted. But again, uh, it will, um, the degree to which they are effective will be in part decided by how effective the banking supervision agency is. They are limited to regulated institutions. So for instance, if a lot of the inflows are being done by non-banks, then you, one needs to think of a way that you can address both types of institutions. Um, and this is you know, what I also mean by the last bullet that you have to think within about whether you, know, you can do this for all the relevant actors who are engaged in capital info. So I think I slightly overshot the three minute deadline again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear from Mark Weisbrot, who is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, and he is a well-known expert on the IMF, having written numerous articles and research papers about the IMF in the last decade. His recent papers include IMF-supported macroeconomic policies and the world recession, which is a comprehensive look at 41 borrowing countries um, uh, that was just published about six months ago. And Sieper also published this week a new paper called Capital Controls and Monetary Policy in Developing Countries um, that's out on the front in case you didn't get a chance to see it. Mark holds a PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. And I wish that I had turned off my phone before we started. <laughs> what well, thanks to everybody for coming, and thanks to you for coming to uh, make the presentation. You know, if you can put that uh, slide with the completed Venn diagram back, I like that one, I might want to use it. <laughs> um, in fact, I want to use your uh, paper, because <laughs> I, I think it's uh, it's called a staff position note. I guess with uh, no bad intent intended, I would call it a staff change of position note. <laughs> I think it's the biggest change of position I've seen in the IMF uh, at least uh, 15 years on a substantive issue. Uh, somebody can correct me if they think there's something else. I mean, the Rethinking Macroeconomics paper, which came out right about the same time, is it's not as concrete, but it, it also is, represents an actual rethinking. So those of us who have been working for reform around the IMF, and that's the audience I want to address myself to, because some people will be watching this on the web um, as well. Um, I think uh, we're always, we're happy to see that. And uh, unfortunately, as many of you know, uh, just a week or two ago, the global financial stability report from the IMF um, took back uh, a lot of what is in fine paper. Um, so, you know, that reflects, I think, the different interests. And let's face it, you know, I, when I say anything about the IMF, I'm not criticizing them per se because they have bosses. They have an executive board. And uh, the, uh, the U.S. Treasury is number one. And then they have some friends in Europe and Japan. And that's really who runs the organization. And so, you know, if the IMF doesn't support the financial transactions tax, for example, I think people should complain to the Obama administration because it's the U.S. Treasury that has a veto over that and uh, may very well be using it as we speak. So uh, that's, uh, you know, just as a caveat because I am critical as well of some of this. Uh, 
And, but I want to start with some of the things that the paper says, because I, I think, uh, if I can just quote a little bit, uh, I think it's, it, is a, it is a big change of uh, position and emphasis. So you have this, uh, for example, they say that concerns that foreign investors may be subject to herd behavior and suffer from excessive optimism have grown stronger with the recent crisis. And even when flows are fundamentally sound, capital flows, it's recognized that they may contribute to collateral damage including bubbles and asset booms and busts. This is a change too. You know, the IMF didn't really say anything about the two worlds, the biggest asset bubbles in world history uh, that occurred uh, in the stock market bubble in the uh, 90, late 90s and the housing bubble, which was, we had already published papers on in 2002. There was really almost nothing in the WIO reports until after those were, were gone. There was maybe one that's pointed out that they really say it's a bubble. Now the IMF is actually saying things about bubbles and the dangers of inflating bubbles in the economic recovery. Uh, so, and that's very important. You can see in one of the prior graphs that Razor put up, you have these huge inflows already in places like Russia and India and Brazil. And uh, they can, in fact, lead to uh, bubbles which can have consequences, um, as we've seen in the worst recession in the United States, for example, was caused by uh, an $8 trillion housing bubble. And that's why I think that um, the first thing that bubble. And I think that it's important. I don't think we can separate, uh, as this paper does, the inflows uh, from the outflows. There are two sides of the same coin. And when you get the, enough of the inflows, you will get an outflow. And in this sense, I think another thing that is missing from this paper uh, is uh, some of the context that, that I think is extremely important. For example, the Asian crisis, which was the worst financial crisis we had prior to uh, the one that happened recently, uh, was caused very quite obviously uh, by a reversal of capital flows, about 11% of GDP within a year and a half or so reversed. Um, in the countries of South Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, countries that were hardest hit. And so this was the real cause of that crisis, just as sure as the collapse of the housing bubble in the United States was the, <coughs> not only the proximate, but the real uh, cause of the uh, recession that we had here. And so that's very important, and that shows, I think, that controls on outflows are also uh, part of the story and part of what is needed. And we did mention in the paper that Deborah uh, mentioned that um, uh, Malaysia did use uh, capital controls on outflows with uh, some success, at least uh, during that uh, crisis. And obviously, they're more difficult. We've talked about that. But I think it's also a very important uh, part of the story. Um, and I have to say, that, uh, again, um, this is more a criticism of the Treasury than the fund itself, but the Treasury and the fund were largely responsible for the removal of the prudential regulation and the controls, uh, quite serious controls that a lot of these countries, especially Indonesia, had on uh, capital uh, flows uh, before the crisis. And then after the crisis, uh, they actually use the crisis. There's a nice paper by uh, Morris Goldstein from the uh, Inter Institute for International Economics um, where he looks at the actual conditions that were imposed. And some of those were conditions to further open the capital markets in these countries in spite of the fact that this was the major uh, contributing cause to the, the crisis itself. And then at that time, the IMF also considered uh, changing its, uh, amending its articles of agreement uh, in order to uh, police the capital account, that is, that, uh, in order to try and, and uh, get the countries to open up their capital accounts, and that was abandoned. Uh, but I say this uh, again because this is why we welcome this kind of change. It really is a change in thinking, and not only from what happened uh, 11 years ago, but also even in the recent crisis, for example, Reza mentioned the uh, increase uh, in uh, the Brazil's use of taxes last year, uh, capital controls in the form of taxes on inflows. 
And the IMF responded, at least publicly, they responded negatively uh, to that as well. And in the uh, agreement last year with Ukraine, uh, which also used uh, capital controls during the crisis, you see uh, part of that agreement with the IMF uh, is for uh, phasing out of those controls. So uh, it, it is not clear. I mean, obviously, the IMF is changing its position here, but we have still very recent practice, which is uh, consistent with the IMF's longstanding, um, uh, I would say, um, opposition to lack of enthusiasm uh, for, uh, as a range, uh, for capital controls. Um, so that's why it's important to look at uh, some of these uh, details. And uh, now, here, uh, before I, uh, well, there's two things I want to do with this paper. One is to reinforce uh, the points uh, that make, they make that I agree with, <laughs> and then to uh, disagree with the ones that I disagree with. So just to uh, reinforce uh, a point in the paper, the paper emphasizes that one of the problems of capital inflows uh, is exchange rate appreciation. Now, what I would say is I, I would put even more emphasis on that uh, than, than the fund does, based on our analysis, for example. Again, the, the paper we have, I think I put an executive summary out there because it's very long, uh, a paper we recently released on the history of exchange rates uh, in Latin America. And you can see, first of all, that overvalued exchange rates uh, going back to the 1970s have had a, a, a have led to serious uh, balance of payments crisis that ended often in disaster. Um, uh, so, you know, in, in the 70s, in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Chile, and of course, more recently in Argentina during the 90s. But then you have also the other experience, and that is the most uh, uh, successful growth experiences in Latin America it tended to be periods, uh, you know, the Brazilian miracle started in the late uh, the 60s, the Chilean experience in the mid 80s and 90s, the uh, Argentine experience from 2002 to 2008. These were periods where uh, governments uh, targeted a stable and competitive exchange, exchange rate real exchange rate, stable competitive real exchange rate. So we think that's important, and I don't think it has enough emphasis here. One thing is missing from this paper, even though the emphasis on exchange rate appreciation is very appreciated by us, um, they don't talk about volatility. And I think volatility itself is something that a government will want to manage. If you look at Brazil, for example, you've had over the last uh, 20 to 30 years, really, uh, problems with exchange rate volatility and exchange rate appreciation both. And I would argue that that's one of the reasons why the Brazilian economy has not done very well over the last 30 years. It's grown, you know, it's put in there with the BRIC countries, but uh, it doesn't have the kind of growth rates of, of the others. Uh, in fact, uh, over the last uh, 30 years, uh, the per capita GDP has grown maybe 7 tenths of 1% annually on average in Brazil. And I would say that that uh, kind of policy, and in recent years, of course, inflation targeting, uh, which uh, inflation targeting policy, also not mentioned in here, but which is part of this story, because uh, in, in inflation targeting regimes, you have the central bank targeting the exchange rate and allowing the, uh, the time, sorry, targeting inflation only, and allowing the exchange rate to appreciate, uh, which is this. Um, uh, this part of the Venn diagram, um, and um, uh, as opposed to trying to manage the exchange rate as well as the inflation rate, and uh, of course there's that the economist called the trilemma. It's very difficult to manage the interest rate, the exchange rate, and um, The, uh, uh, the interest rate, uh, the exchange rate, and what's the third one? The um, uh, the oh, how can I forget? <laughs> Part of the trilemma. Um, you're managing the domestic interest rate and the exchange rate. Oh yeah, and and still have open capital movements. That's the trilemma. And that's where the capital controls uh, come in, right? Because that's where you need them if you want to, if you actually want to manage both the interest rate and inflation and exchange rate. And that is pointed out in this paper. I think they make a point out of that, that, you know, there's times when the, the 
the central bank wants to control inflation, and the, they try to raise interest rates, and uh, what happens? You get a huge capital inflow, and then you have this choice between letting the exchange rate uh, appreciate. And the paper also points out that uh, this is a serious problem because the, the uh, exchange rate appreciation can do permanent uh, damage to the tradable goods sector, whereas the capital inflows can be just temporary. You have that in there, and I think that's very important to point out. So capital controls, I think, are much more important when you look at it in the context of the history of macroeconomic policy and the needs uh, for uh, in the real world. I mean, most central banks are, in fact, uh, targeting the exchange rate to some degree, even the ones that say they're um, they're pure inflation targeters. They're very often intervening in the foreign exchange market to keep uh, to to smooth out uh, some of the fluctuations to prevent uh, speculators from being able to have a one-way bet, which is of course very uh, dangerous. And for other purposes, that being the reality, that means if you accept that as the reality of the world, and you accept that that's important to growth and development policy and everything else that. Uh, developing countries care about, then you're going to put even a lot more emphasis on capital control. And you're going to be a lot less worried, I think, about some of the negatives uh, that are raised in this paper. I guess the other reason I would have a, uh, less worried about the negatives is because I think uh, we've already seen from the most recent crisis that the financial sector has become too big and too powerful and too destructive. So I'm not as worried as uh, maybe some other people are about um, you know, uh, capital controls leading to some kind of discouraging of, uh, of, uh, of portfolio inflows. Uh, I think there's probably too much anyway, uh, and uh, and it's uh, you know it's just like in the United States. Uh, are we really worried that the financial sector will get smaller if we have a financial transaction tax? I think that's the point of it actually, is to uh, shrink. <laughs> This overbloated uh, sector, which accounted for you know 30 to 40 percent of uh, corporate profits at the peak of the uh, bubble year, and I think the same is true to a certain extent internationally. We don't want to discourage uh, inflows altogether, but it's not as much of a danger, perhaps, as pointed out. The other thing that I really have to take issue with is this uh, two two other negatives that are raised in the paper. I want to take issue with. Okay, one is. Uh, the idea that we have to be, well, maybe there's three in here. Uh, one is the idea that we have to be worried about the multilateral effects of countries using, you know, developing countries using capital. In other words, they argue in the paper that, um, well, you know, it's good for one country, but then there's, uh, if everybody starts doing it, then you have a, what they said, actually used the word beggar thy neighbor policy in an analogy to competitive devaluations, right? Where you have one country devalues their currency, it's good for them, but then everybody does it, it becomes a mess. And um, I don't think the analogy is, is valid here. I think, so what if everybody has capital controls? That's actually, it seems to be a, a good argument for what the, what uh, Arvin Subramani, on the IMF, former IMF economist, argued that that's really an argument for coordinating capital controls more. And even if you don't have good coordination, so maybe capital will stay home more. Uh, not such a terrible thing necessarily for the world. So I don't think see, see that as any kind of a, a real threat. I also don't see the other negative argument that is made here, is that capital controls could lead, uh, make it harder to adjust world imbalances. Uh, so they're obviously referring to China here, most likely. <laughs> I'm not going to read into it, but um, you have, uh, I don't really see this. I think. Um, countries can adjust and balance it. That's an exchange rate policy decision, and you're going to make that with or without. And the idea that if you don't have capital controls, the markets are going to adjust your exchange rate for you. So you'll get these inflows and your appreciation. Well, you know, that might be true, but that's not necessarily going to give you more, uh, less imbalances. It could give you more imbalances. And that leads me to my third point. Uh, uh, which I, where I, I disagree with the negative case that's being made uh, from the fund. Uh, and that is the idea uh, that you see the word repeatedly used that we have to worry about distortions caused by uh, capital controls. Now, 
there's a whole literature that goes back for 150 years on uh, the gains from trade and distortions involved with uh, various forms of uh, protection, uh, which are very big. In fact, we've emphasized them at, at CEPR in the case of patent and uh, copyrights and other monopolies can be very large. Uh, unfortunately, the whole debate uh, around free, so-called free trade has been grossly exaggerated and gains due to you know, removal of certain restrictions have been exaggerated and other really huge monopolies like the patent government have been ignored. But nonetheless, there's a body of literature and there's an analysis and there's, you know, we all learn about dead weight losses in, in, in our Econ 101 uh, classes. And uh, there's, real, there's a real argument here. I don't see this, I think this is a misplaced analogy uh, to uh, trade. Uh, from uh, capital markets. I don't really see the same thing. These capital markets, uh, by their very nature, the, you know, asset bubbles, irrational exuberance, herd behavior, overshooting, these things are the norm in capital markets. And you really don't have a case made yet, at least empirically, or even I would say theoretically, uh, that um, we really have to worry about uh, distortions being caused. We've got distortions every day being caused by uh, capital movements. And uh, these can be huge, and as we can see, they can lead to devastating consequences. You know, one of the recent consequences that's mentioned in this paper in passing is uh, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. They got hit really hard with the capital outflows uh, that came in, of course, uh, during their their bubble years and some of the worst declines on record. Uh, Latvia, 24, 25%, Estonia, 20% losses in GDP. <laughs> and these are these are examples of uh, you know brought on by capital movements. I would argue about their other macro economic policies as well, but that's a, that's a different story. But still, capital outflows uh, have, a, have been a major cause of it. In fact, George Soros has at least a couple of books all about uh, how uh, financial markets uh, tend to, um, you know, uh, go all over the place and, and are, are subject to uh, uh, all kinds of uh, irrational exuberance. And in fact, he's uh, and overshooting, and he's made quite a lot of money uh, betting on those things. Three point three billion last year. Um, so. Uh, you can see that there, there's uh, at least some argument, I think a strong argument on, on one side, that capital markets need uh, this kind of regulation, and I don't think you have a great argument on the other side um, to, uh, to say that we're, we're, we're going to run into these terrible uh, welfare distorting uh, losses as a result of capital flows. So I guess I would sum up by saying I really I do like the IMF's uh, paper for the arguments that it makes. I think they can be a lot stronger if we look at uh, macroeconomic uh, policy in practice um, and the effects of uh, capital inflows and outflows in practice a little, uh, with, especially with the recent experience. And uh, I think that um, the, the outflow side, of course, is, is, is also uh, perhaps equally important with the inflow side. And the last thing I would say from the point of view of reform, I do want to emphasize uh, once again that it is the U.S. government. Uh, the U.S. government should be uh, a target of anybody who, who wants to uh, reform the IMF's uh, practices. That's not to say that the IMF has, you know, it's still an institution in itself and these debates matter within the fund you know, to their practice. And certain, certainly there are issues in countries that the U.S. Treasury and its allies don't care about as much. And in those countries, it will make even more of a difference um, what the IMF uh, says. But I do think that uh, it's going to take a lot of push. You know, um, besides the bosses that you guys have in the Treasury Department, there's another set of bosses over Treasury. It's called the uh, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating to say that Wall Street has a very strong influence on the uh, U.S. Uh, Treasury and the U.S. government. And um, that was the book's perhaps an understatement. <laughs> uh, and uh, so 
that's a lot of what you're seeing, I think, uh, when you know you have economists at the IMF who understand the importance of these things and uh, a change in policy, and it doesn't necessarily.